Hi and welcome back. In my last video I discussed the logic, the rationale and the science, as far as we have it, for extended fasting as an intervention for long Covid and potentially ME-CFS. In this video I'm going to discuss my experience of doing two extended fasts three months apart. So things like what actually happens when you go to fast somewhere, what are the logistics and practical considerations. In the next video I'm going to discuss the difference it's made to my symptoms and in the final part a discussion regarding its application to long Covid generally. What I do have to say up front is that stories abound on social media of long haulers crashing really hard when they try to fast. And for those with moderate to severe ME-CFS, the ME-CFS phenotype of long Covid or dysautonomia and POTS, you do need to have a certain minimum function level to even attempt it. I believed that my baseline was probably above this level, but I was certain I still wanted medical supervision. Now, having completed two extended fasts, 15 days and 19 days, I can safely say that fasting is really, really hard. Uh, that's even if you're well, um, and even harder if you have long Covid. So when I go and do my third, I'm going to go back to the clinic rather than trying to do it at home, or indeed anywhere else. Extended fasting is not something to be undertaken lightly, and if you can't go to a specialist clinic I do have to advise consulting with your doctor first if you wanted to try it. And if you do decide to fast at home then make sure you have appropriate medical supervision and instruction. At this point I do also have to declare that I have no conflicts of interest in talking about this subject, I paid full list price for both my clinic stays and got no special treatment. So what put me on to extended fasting as a potential intervention in the first place? It was a friend of mine, thank you to Fabian, who was at least as sick as me two years ago and is now fully recovered. He attributes that recovery entirely due to a series of extended fasts over the course of 12 months or so. He was nagging me repeatedly to look into it and so I finally did. I started doing some of my own research and thought you know what, there really could be something in this. And intuitively the idea of rebooting your body just felt intrinsically right. I mean maybe in five years we can throw some immune modulating drugs at the condition but there won't be a silver bullet and they'll probably have rancid side effects. Trying to shake the body itself out of the doom loop it's got itself stuck in just seems to make much more sense. The first choice you have to make is what kind of fast you want to do. Water, Buchinger or juice. My friend had done the Bukinger style and it sounded good. So that was that decision made. The next decision was, well, where and how do you do it? Personally, I felt like I definitely wanted medical supervision, so I'd need a clinic that did Bukinger fasting. There are a handful of them, mostly in Germany. The official Bukinger Wilhelmi clinic is apparently very good, but also booked up forever and very expensive. There are a few other options, generally about half the price, and easier to get to as well. So I chose Menschel's Vital Resort based on the power of Google reviews and uh, one personal recommendation, and it was about an hour west of Frankfurt. For reference, yes it is possible to do an extended Bukinger style fast at home and there's lots of resources and advice available online, in fact quite a lot of it coming from the Bukinger Wilhelmi clinic itself, and I will discuss my thoughts on trying to do that in the final video. But of course I do need to say again, please consult with your doctor first before diving in. So for my first fast, which was September into October last year, I booked an 18 day stay of which 15 days would be fasting. The refeeding period at the end of the fast is really important, so I wanted to make sure that I had the first two or three days of that refeeding taken care of at the clinic. The run up to the fast is also important, so in the preceding week you need to taper down on meat, carbs, calories and caffeine to prepare your body for it. And after catching my two most recent Covids on planes, I no longer fly if I can possibly help it, so I took my time and spent a couple of days driving out to Germany. I arrived in the late afternoon, had a final light meal of vegetables, saw the doctor in the following morning for a physical assessment and consultation, and then the fast begins. Buking a fasting involves taking on about 150 to 200 calories a day. This consists of a small fresh fruit juice in the morning, then a vegetable broth for lunch, and either another broth or juice for dinner. Having meals in this way still helps keep some structure in the day and is quite psychologically important. There is a variety of juices and broths so you don't get too sick of the same thing. 
One big question that people coming into fasting often have is, what do I do about my medications and supplements? And this is obviously something that you have to discuss with your personal doctor and the clinic doctor, but I can share what I did. So on the supplements front, probably like most of you watching, I had so many every day, it was about three full mouthfuls of pills. And as for medication, I was on four of them, which were two antihistamines, fexofenadine and famotidine, and then an SSRI, escitalopram, and metazapine. Uh, during the fast, I ditched all of the supplements, uh, apart from melatonin at night, because sleep's really hard and you need all the help you can get. Um, and as for the medication, I came off the antihistamines and I halved the escitalopram dose. As an aside, since that first fast, I've coped just fine without any of those supplements I was previously taking. Is that because of improvements due to the fast or because they never did anything in the first place? Who knows? Uh, and on the plus side, I'm also down to only occasional antihistamine use. I'm gonna talk about the whys and hows regarding symptoms in the next video. On my second fast, I knocked out the metazapine as well um, during the fast itself, as it interferes with metabolism, which I didn't want whilst fasting. Uh, but now I'm finished, I am now taking it again, simply because sleep is so important. It's also worth knowing that clinics that do booking a style fasting usually offer some other treatments too as part of the package. At Menschel's, this involved daily hot liver compresses, which is a traditional thing going back over 100 years. Also a number of massages, gentle osteopathy sessions, as well as enemas and colonics, which is also traditional going back a long time. In terms of the type and quantity of medical supervision, in addition to the primary assessment, you see the doctor every other day and have blood pressure, heart rate, and weight taken and assessed. Uh, you have two full sets of bloods, the first a few days after you start to make sure your body is reacting to the fast as it should, and another at the end to see what might have changed. So without specifically talking about symptomatic improvement, because that's the subject in itself for the next video, what's extended fasting like? It's a bit of a shock at first, to be honest. Um, when I thought about it, I was like, what's the longest I've gone without food before in my whole life? And it's actually not that long, perhaps like 24 hours when really sick as a kid or something. So when you start pushing the boundaries out, skipping meal after meal after meal or real solid food, and you get to 36, 48 hours, 72 hours, it does feel pretty radical. And it's not just that, but the first few days of a fast are actually really tough physiologically, um, probably the toughest, because your body switches into full ketosis and releases a huge amount of cortisol. It's hard if you're healthy in fasting, and I suspect it's significantly harder if you're also battling long COVID. Sleep is one of the hardest things to come by, especially in those early days of the fast, due to that amount of cortisol being pumped out by your body. You need to expect some pretty sleepless nights, and if you're already sensitive to a lack of sleep or have poor quality sleep, like most of us do with long COVID, then this means the days are gonna feel pretty rough. One reason why I wanted to go to a clinic is that whilst you're there, there's no expectations, obligations, or behavior patterns that you might have at home. You can be completely selfish and just look after your own needs. So when you need to rest, you just can. So it doesn't matter if you're not that functional during the day. You don't even need to worry about preparing your meals as that's all done for you too. Once I got past the first few days, things settled down a bit. Um, I got repeated pangs of a strange kind of hunger, not a normal kind of hunger. Um, your body is really quite aware that food <laughs> is still highly appealing, and you start to fantasize about that mystical, magical world of eating again. Energy-wise, I didn't feel too bad by long COVID standards. My biggest issue was just dealing with disrupted night's sleep and the impact that had on function. You're generally encouraged to be as active as you feel able. For me, this meant I'd go for the odd short walk, perhaps 10 gentle minutes or so, um, and then do 10 lengths in the pool, followed by a sauna, which sounds rad, doesn't it? I'll talk about that in the next video. I didn't really feel in the right frame of mind to work, but I was able to read in bursts, and I got through about three books each time I went out to fast. One thing that I ought to briefly mention is the emotional journey of fasting. And this is actually really heavy duty, and it's normal to go through the ringer emotionally as well as physically. It can be a purge in just about all senses. And I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next video. And finally, when it comes to break your fast, uh, you start with a baked apple at lunch, and then you slowly build up uh, on easily digestible food in small quantities 
gently increasing them over the period of sort of two, three, four, five days or so. And you can eat normally again after about a week. Then before you check out, you see the doctor for a final physical assessment and discussion and are free to go. The big question, which I'm sure everyone is waiting for, well, how much weight do you lose? Well, on the first 15 day fast, I went down from 78 kilos um, upon starting to 71 at the end. And on the second 19 day fast, I went from 75 kilos at the start to 68 kilos by the end. I am intending on going back for another fast, but I feel like I need to get my weight back up to at least 75 kilos or so before I do. Generally speaking, there is no contraindication for being slim and trying to fast, but the medical advice is that you ought to have a BMI of at least 18.5 at the end of the fast. So it's worth being aware of that. I hope that's helped describe the physical logistics of fasting. If you've got any questions about any of this, please do chuck them in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. In the next video, I'll be discussing the impacts on my long COVID symptoms. And in the final part, I'll discuss the lessons I've learned and some general thoughts if you wanted to try it yourself. With, of course, once again, the proviso that you absolutely shouldn't take my word for it, but consult your doctor first. Look after yourselves. Until next time.